I think there's they don't know what they're unleashing by changing the rules so fundamentally and just going full banana republic. I don't think they're gonna like the path that leads to. Have have you done a deep dive on BLM's financial background? And no. they're like so I I mean it's it's ruled by the financial side is ruled by the obvious uh suspects. But um have you noticed they've been awfully quiet with regards to Israel and Palestine? Yeah, like I how ISIS was awfully quiet with regards to Israel. Yeah, well that <laughs> so um the the thing is BLM because of who runs their financial side the main organization is essentially neutered at this point it can't actually do anything the subsidiaries that are s- usually independent or semi independent oh they're very vocal they're on the Palestinian side and you know you go to L- if you go to the ADL website you'll see like fringe BLM movements where they talk about how pro Palestine they are without realizing that these are now effectively more 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 effective and larger than the main BLM organization which again is is a captured castle for for their side. Um, you know the the entire board of BLM is is majority, well non black we'll say, and uh, it's it's essentially like the 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 tools that they had to do what they did in twenty twenty have already run their course. They don't have the the effectiveness that they had in twenty twenty, and they can't really be pulled out in twenty twenty four because they just don't have the organizational capacity. Like BLM is a, is an empty shell corporation at this point. It just takes donations and gives it to to the finance side. It doesn't actually do anything anymore. And uh, plenty of other organizations are like that. Like Antifa is a joke now. They can't actually do anything. The, these organizations that they propped up in 2020 and then promptly burned the political capital that they had within a year. And within a year, they were just shells of what they were. Uh, and and Luth Emplar, that's that's one of the, the core reasons that I believe that they can't control themselves anymore as a movement is because their organizations of central control, right, their institutions are very badly damaged. You know, they don't have as much centralized control anymore and their base is sort of running rampant. And I think that, you know, you've you've spoken about the internet, the civil war between the two factions of the Democratic Party. And I think that The problem is, right, is the successor to the elite class, right, the millennials and down, have been so thoroughly saturated in progressive ideology, they never really got the memo that that's just what you say, you don't actually do it. And so you're seeing a disconnect between the kind of like old elite who control a lot of these institutions just by having institutional capture, right, versus their successors who are unhinged ideologues. Yeah, but like I- ideologues are a tool; they're not the head. Like an ideologue can never lead anything because it can't deal with exceptions and paradoxes. That's why ideologues are always your your foot soldiers, never your leaders. Once ideologues become leaders, they they just crumble. They they cannot deal with the, with the contradictions. Well, I don't disagree with you if we're talking about like being an actual legitimate, effective political force. But I mean, I think that basically this is just like. This is closer to to like a social disease than anything. You know, it's just kind of bringing yeah, down yeah. us with it. Yeah, but maybe I'm just too high on white pills. But I I can't see that kind of ideological puritanism as actually doing much more than having a hissy fit once it actually has the chance to grab power, because power really and power does require a certain degree of tolerating contradiction and paradox for the sake of it to work. Uh, you tolerate things that one does and same things that your enemy does you don't tolerate they they don't show any ability to master power that way and as a result they're, they're just going to hold too tight until it fails them basically well i guess we'll see i don't want to just turn this into a debate yeah, no, between no, you no, and no. I, Templar, but uh i think we both <laughs> set out our argument well yeah um it's i don't uh, i don't have much to say on this because you're both making decent points but uh, while well, it's all going to clarify itself in uh, about 11 months or so, won't it? So, with Emplar, we'll, I've got uh, an idea. Let's you and I make a public bet over this for a cigar. <laughs> You're the first ones to do it. <laughs> I, I, I would be willing to do that because, as you know, uh, I, I, I do you owe you a cigar for all the cigars you, you got me addicted to. <laughs> so for reference, I did get Luth Emplar addicted to nicotine. Uh, that may be my fault. <laughs> All right. Yes. So we're doing it. We're doing it. Official cigar bet between the two. Yeah, yeah, I'll take him up on that. All right. What What are the terms? Uh, Trump, yes or no? Trump wins, yes yeah. or no? I think is is it. I'm I'm yes, he's no. 
Okay, fair enough. Here's the, here's the thing: if Trump actually wins, a, a cigar like uh, it doesn't matter, you know. But, <laughs> but if he loses, it's like okay, at least there's consolation in that. You know? Yeah, this is what we okay. call a covered position in the finance world.